Hey, ¿qué tal amigos? Stuart here from Spain Speaks. Today with a new type of video, I'm going to be having a look at some of the articles that have caught my attention in the press over the last week about Spain. And uh, the idea is to, to get a debate happening on some of these topics and to help me understand Spain a little bit better and to help you also understand how this country works a little bit better. And uh, some of the articles are more serious than others. Some are a more light-hearted look at what's going on here. I'll give my opinion on some of the topics as well and try to give a bit of a, a background. And uh, again, as I said, to try to get this debate happening with you in the comment section, which is something that um, uh, motivates me to make more videos on this channel. Now, the first thing we're going to be looking at this week is a trade problem, a trade dispute, let's say, between Spain and Mexico, or the European Union and Mexico, um, uh, rather. And it's about cheese, and in particular, the uh, famous Spanish cheese, Manchego cheese. Because apparently, in Mexico, there is also a cheese that they call uh, Manchego. Now, for those of you that are not familiar with Manchego cheese, La Mancha is a region um, just south of Madrid. Madrid's in the center. Uh, La Mancha is also south of Madrid. And uh, it's uh, got its own cheese, and it's protected by the... Um, the by a, a law which is called PDO, which is the uh, Protected Designation of Origin. In Spanish, they call this uh, Denominación de Origen, and this is a common characteristic, not only in Europe, but in other countries around the world. Uh, and it's when a, a particular product is made uh, in a certain area with certain uh, products. In this particular case, as I said, it's a cheese. So the uh, protected origin status means that the cheese has to be made with a certain type of sheep, which is only found in this uh, one particular area in Spain called La Mancha. So the cheese, Manchego cheese, has this uh, protected designation of origin status, as does uh, prosciutto ham, and I think there's some cheeses in the UK that also have this uh, protected status. Other products in Spain as well, like uh, wines from uh, Rioja and uh, Ribera del Duero, uh, other Italian products, French products, champagne, and uh, the Mexicans have their own cheese called Manchego cheese, but it's nothing uh, similar to the one here in Spain. It's it's like um, a cheese that they use uh, in fajitas and uh, the other uh, Mexican you know dishes like that. And it's a it's a really cheap type of cheese. Apparently, from what I've been reading, it's probably similar to the the same problem that um, cheddar cheese has obviously cheddar uh, being an area in the uk but the concept of cheddar that you have in australia in the states and in other countries around the world is of this really bad quality cheese i think cheddar cheese if you get actually a good one from the source it's a very very tasty cheese and in fact the uk has a lot of tasty cheeses but cheddar has this bad reputation and for some reason cheddar is not a protected designation of origin uh, cheese for some reason. I don't know what the reason is. Um, but that's one of the problems that they have with that cheese. So in Mexico, uh, Manchego has this uh, more, uh, let's say, cheap um, characteristic. People associate uh, people associate it with the cheap cheese with um, with a cheese that's uh, you know that, that you buy easily from the supermarket now not this manchego cheese the, the the traditional Spanish one so the European Union which is trying to come to a, some type of trade agreement with Mexico at the moment is trying to get the Mexicans to change the, what they call this cheese and apparently in Mexico they still don't respect a lot of these um, uh, protected uh, names and they call, uh, you know, parmesan type cheese, cheddar type cheese, well not cheddar but uh, manchego type cheese, etc. So they don't really respect these things. But the European Union is trying to get Mexico to respect the protected status and uh, hence the deadlock. And the bureaucrats, obviously the bureaucrats always involved here, are trying to uh, break this deadlock 
And uh, yeah, as I said, get the Mexicans to change the name. Now, I don't know whether this will be successful, but obviously the uh, Spanish Manchego cheese producers want this to happen because they want to be able to maintain the uniqueness of their cheese. And of course, with that uniqueness comes higher prices, um, quality control and all of those things, which uh, is basically is what the producer is looking for. And as I said, cheddar has this bad reputation as uh, as a, as you know a, a cheap plasticky type cheese. Probably, as I said, a long way away from reality if you try one of the original cheddar cheeses in cheddar. But anyway, that was the first piece of news that we were looking at today. The second piece of news that I have here. From a, a source, uh, let me have a look where this one is from. Yeah, the title, Why Spain is Living in Fear of Losing Its Siesta. Now, I saw this in a, an online newspaper. Uh, Spain is in fear of losing its siesta. Now, I don't know whether Spain is in fear of losing its siesta, but I read this article. And um, uh, one of the things that caught my attention was uh, an Australian tourist, Naomi Holdsworth, 45 years old, said, It's absolutely crazy that this still goes on. She wants to go shopping at, uh, during the siesta time. She wants to be able to buy things. She can't understand how the economy can just shut down from two to five every day when there's people that want to buy products. And then, of course, they uh, interview a couple of um Spanish shopkeepers and they say that the siesta is a tradition, we have to have this siesta, we have to do this, we have to do that. And obviously it is part of the culture here in Spain. Not necessarily in the big cities, but of course when you go to smaller cities like Salamanca, it's probably common that a lot of the small retailers shut down between two and five because they have lunch basically. Basically they have that time to, to have lunch and they go home, they have a home cooked meal. They have a first course, they have a second course, they have dessert, they have a glass of wine. And of course, after a big meal like that, they watch TV. The Spanish news starts at three o'clock in the afternoon, so people watch the news. And then after the news, perhaps they get 40 winks. They shut their eyes, they, uh, they uh, relax for 30 or 40 minutes, and then they get back to work. They open again and they work through to about eight or nine o'clock, which is normally the case. Uh, in Madrid, Barcelona, in the uh, chains, like if you go, for example, to a, a Zara or a, a Corte Inglés, those places are not going to close down. Primark in Madrid doesn't shut between two and five, for example. Uh, but some of the smaller shops still do. And um, one of the reasons that it happens more in the uh, smaller cities is because people can go home. In Madrid, you can't really go home because if you're living like where I live, which is 20 kilometers away, and it takes you an hour to get in uh, to Madrid and out of Madrid every day. It doesn't really make sense to come home for lunch. So people uh, have a, you know, a lunch in the city. They have a sandwich. They have a menu del dia. And uh, they're not really as worried about the siesta as they are in other places. But I can understand that it is part of the tradition here in Spain. And there has been uh, talk Politicians have been talking about trying to change the, the working day here in Spain to bring it more in line with the rest of Europe, you know, starting work, um, well, people start work at, you know, 8.30 or 9, but finishing work at a more reasonable time at, uh, you know, 5, 5.30, 6 o'clock, rather than 7, 8 o'clock, which is uh, what um, a lot of people uh, do now. They finish work quite late. The next thing on the agenda today. Let me have a look if I can find it here. Okay, this is from the English uh, Press, a newspaper. I can't remember which newspaper it was. I think it was the Express. Uh, Spain on brink. Spanish PM's popularity plummets to historic low as Catalonia still threat. Now, Spain on brink. I don't know what Spain is on the brink of. Revolution? I don't know. Maybe it's on the brink of some type of um, uprising. Maybe it's on the brink of splitting. I have no idea what they mean to say. I think this paper is a uh, an anti-European paper, so obviously it's a little bit sensationalist, this type of news. In the Spanish news, there wasn't anything as radical as this. Uh, the Spanish PM's popularity has plummeted. 
In fact, I don't think Mr. Rajoy has ever been a very popular uh, person. The party has been able to win elections, but I don't think people necessarily voted for Mr. Rajoy. Rajoy's been in politics for a long time here in Spain. Uh, he uh, took over from Athnad back in the, oh, let me think when it was, probably back in the early 2000s. And he lost two general elections as the leader of the PP, won the third general election, and, his, and has been in power ever since. So uh, by losing the first two, you get the idea that he's not obviously one of the most popular people on the planet or in this country. But he's one of these politicians that um, keeps standing while everyone else falls over which is uh, surprising that he manages to uh, keep on his feet considering the amount of um, uh, corruption scandals that have been going on around him, some tweets that he sent out to some of the people involved in those corruption scandals. Uh, but he's still there. And uh, the Catalonia affair obviously uh, didn't do him any favours. And as a result, his popularity has plummeted even more. So it'll be interesting to see what happens in the next elections uh, because there's a new political party called Ciudadanos, which is like uh, citizens. They are a new party. They were uh, quite well uh, voted uh, in the last Catalan elections. And apparently, according to the latest polls, they're more popular at the moment than the Partido Popular or the popular party uh, that uh, Mr. Rajoy uh, controls as the leader of that party and the leader of the government here in Spain. And um, let's have a look. One other thing, just quickly before we finish with this news, and it is that Spain has or is about to overtake the USA as the second most popular tourist destination in the world. Uh, reading into this, there's a couple of reasons for this. And um, um, obviously, uh, a lot of people have stopped going to North African resorts, Egypt and places like that because of the potential terrorist threat. But they're also calling it the, uh, the Trump effect as well. OK, the Trump effect, because um, Spain's going to overtake the USA as the second most popular tourist destination in the world. I think France is the first. Spain number two, uh, or going to become number two. And a lot of people are saying that uh, the Trump effect is um, uh, turning people away from the USA. Now, it's uh, a bit of a, uh, um, uh, there's a bit of a contradiction here because last year there was uh, quite a lot of anti-tourism protests in Spain. And uh, one uh, part of the article here says, this is sure to displease many Spaniards, particularly in areas like Ibiza and Mallorca and around Barcelona, uh, not only because of the independence push, but also because of the, the, the feeling that a lot of people have that companies like Airbnb and uh, other um, uh, tourist operators or tourist flat operators are squeezing uh, Spanish people out of the cities. It's almost, um, you know, I'm not going to say it's impossible to, to, to find a decent place to rent in a city like Barcelona or Madrid, but uh, rent prices have increased enormously over the last couple of years. And I was talking to a, a friend of mine the other day who rents in Madrid, and he said that uh, it's there's been a 20% increase in the last uh, two years. So if that trend continues, a lot of people are just going to be pushed out of the renting uh, the rental market and uh, almost impossible to, to buy property because of the the increase in tourists, the increase in tourist accommodation, and uh, a lot of, um, not hotel um, brands, but there's a lot of tourist companies that are buying up uh, empty buildings in Madrid and turning them into tourist flats along the, not exactly like Airbnb, but um, you know they're using similar types of strategies in order to get people into short-term accommodation. And it's a lot more lucrative for people that own property there. I mean, instead of getting somebody paying a thousand euros a month for for a flat in the center of Madrid, you can get five, six, seven, eight times that amount of money uh, if you go through these um, other systems like Airbnb. So that's one of the things that is happening here in Spain at the moment. So I'm going to wrap this video up. Questions or comments, please leave them in the section below. If you uh, have any uh, opinion about some of the topics we talked about today here, please leave them in that section below. I'll see you in the next video news about Spain. Hasta luego.